Hi there. In this episode, we're going to learn about the 34-foot double cabin trawler built in the Chunghua Boatyard in Taiwan. The brand of the trawler is indicative of the importer that brought it into the United States. A CHB entered the United States from the Pacific as opposed to a marine trader which entered the United States in New Jersey. We're going to talk about the general construction of boats built in the Chunghua Boatyard and how that construction results in problems down the road for future owners. To illustrate these problems and to help other fellow owners of these vessels know the best way to repair them, we're going to be covering all the repairs that I had to make to the Sea Moose to get it ready for the grand cruising adventure soon to come. If you own one of these fine vessels, or you're thinking about acquiring one, you can be assured that some, if not all, of the problems that I had with the Sea Moose, you're going to have with your boat. When they built the boat, they laid up the two halves of the hull as separate pieces. Within that mold is a shelf with a lip on the inside. That shelf forms the bottom of the decks and also helps to hold up the house. They glued the two halves together and they filled the keel with a combination of round stones that look like river gravel and concrete. Next, they used a tool called a chopper gun to spray milled fibers and polyester resin on top of the concrete. This creates the false bottom that you see at the bottom of the bilge and under the engine. In the next phase, they built a stick frame, much like you'd frame a house, sheathed that with 5 8 marine plywood, and then covered that plywood using that same chopper gun with milled fibers and polyester resin. Next, the interior was constructed. Different crews built the interiors, so you do see differences between one boat and another one. Let's start going over the problem areas one by one, starting with the decks. Most people think of the decks as a sandwich. Teak, fiberglass, Luon plywood and teak, and the lip that's part of the hull. That's only part of the story. If you look at a bridge, it's constructed as a series of boxes. Engineers call this a torsion box. The decks are also a series of boxes. In the middle of the sandwich, are teak struts molded into the shelf that's part of the original mold of the hull. These struts run from the hull across the decks to the base of the house. The torsion boxes in the decks are what enable the decks, the house, and the hull to all flex together. As you walk on the decks, the screws that hold the teak to the top layer of fiberglass eventually work their way loose and water makes its way into the coring. On the sea moose, the decks were so saturated with water that as you made your way down the deck, little fountains of water erupted between the teak struts and the polysulfide caulk in between them. These are called deck squirters, and they are a very bad thing. There are many quick fix deck repair methods out there, but there is only one proper way to repair the decks you must replace the core. First, you need to remove the old teak decking. This is accomplished with a crowbar and a sledgehammer and a chisel. It's not a lot of fun. The best tool for cutting off the old skin is a Dremel Ultrasaw. If you don't have a Dremel Ultrasaw, you can also use a Rotozip with a carbide bit, but it's significantly harder to control. Once you've cut out a section of the old fiberglass skin, pry that off with a crowbar and you'll find Luon plywood in between the teak struts. You need to now dig out all of the Luon plywood. 
In some cases, it will be so rotted you can scoop it out with your hands, and in other cases, you'll need to take a hammer and a chisel and pull it out. Clean the shelf with 40 grit paper to remove all traces of the old core, and give it a few days for the teak struts to dry out. Then, using either starboard or three-quarter inch marine plywood, cut two pieces of plywood that will very tightly fit up underneath the house and up against the hull. You can cut the outside to be flush with the gunnels, or you can leave a little lip like I did. I chose to clean the old skin and reattach it. I mixed epoxy with cavasil and spread that underneath the marine plywood and above it, set the old skin on, laid a couple of cinder blocks with wax paper or trash bags and glued it on. And then I put six ounce fiberglass strips around the edges. If I had to do it again, I wouldn't have done it that way. I would have simply built up the old deck using fresh cloth. While I was recoring the decks, I was also fixing rotted core in the house. We'll get to that in a minute. I laid 18 ounce cloth from the bow to the stern, infused that with resin, and then laid six ounce cloth from the rub rail down the gunnels across the deck and up the sides of the house. After sanding out the large high spots, I then painted it with a mixture of Q-cells, a medium density filler, and epoxy resin to the consistency of mayonnaise and laid that down on the deck and then sanded it fair. Finally, using a fiberglass spreader and a very low density filler, I filled all of the gaps and all of the voids in the gunnels and up the sides of the house. Two coats of Interlux two-part epoxy primer and two coats of Easy Epoxy one coat, followed by very judicious taping and Interlux non-skid deck paint, and I have brand new decks that should last at least another 20 years. The aft deck consists of a pan of fiberglass that runs from the stern to the back wall of the aft stateroom. The steering pulley, which lies on the port side of the lazarette hatch, had always seemed just a little bit loose. To my amazement, I found that a giant hole had been cut in the aft deck. It seems that at some point in the Sea Moose's past history, the aft deck had become so rotted that the steering pulley fell off. The repair that they decided to do was to cut a giant hole in the aft deck and run common one by two furring strips from the stern to the house, securing those with non-marine grade fasteners, which of course had rusted to almost nothing. As a result of this fine craftsmanship, every time that you turned the wheel, the block of wood was tugged on and flexed the aft deck. Look what it did to the pin in the steering pulley. To repair the malfeasance, first I put a block of three-quarter inch marine plywood from the stern to the good part of the deck to replace the part of the pan that they cut out. When I bonded the new piece of coring to the aft deck, it also bonded to this support piece. I had a machine shop remake the pin for the pulley out of titanium and built a new plywood block for it to sit on. Repairing the damage to the lazarette hatch was a little more complicated. First, I took the hatch home and refinished it with four coats of West Marine Clear Epoxy. Once I had finished the repairs to the aft deck, I wrapped one by one strips in wax paper, overlapped the wax paper around the inner edge of the lazarette hatch, took the hatch, put it in the hole wrapped in wax paper, and then laid cinder blocks on top of it. Finally, I took a mixture of epoxy and milled fibers and filled in all the gaps around the hatch, resulting in a hatch that fit perfectly. Here's the final result.
At the bottom of the walls of the house is a strip of white sealant that's there to allow for expansion and contraction. If the water in the decks is bad enough, it will eventually wick through the sealant and up into the walls of the house, rotting out the bottom. You fix this by cutting out the cancerous rotted wood and scarfing in new wood. It's very important that you don't use butt joints, but use 45 to 60 degree angles in order to get the maximum adhesion with the glue. Here, a sloppy repair of the 30 amp shore power receptacle, undoubtedly by the same fine craftsman who worked on the aft deck, resulted in an entire section of the wall being rotted out. In this case, you need to scarf in a much larger piece of plywood. Here, on the starboard aft quarter of the boat, next to the aft head, an improperly attached step up to the flybridge and a leaking window had rotted out an extremely large section. Once the recoring was complete, I ran cloth from the top of the rail, down the gunnels, across the deck, and up the side of the house to the flybridge, stitching it all together into one structure. I literally built a new boat over the shell of the old one. The forward cabin is an area of the boat that's most susceptible to rot. The grab handles on either side of the hatch are a perfect spot for water intrusion as well as the hatch itself and the windshield where it attaches to the forward house. Upon removing the wall coverings, I discovered more amateur repairs. Next, I built a support structure that would preserve the location of the main support beam, which was remarkably rot-free, and did a surgical demolition of the forward house, very carefully removing one section at a time. I had to go all the way back to the end of the forward head to find good wood. Using the lip from the deck shelf to give me a guide, I laminated three pieces of 3 8 marine plywood together to form the new beams for the port and starboard side of the house. I rebuilt the frame using a combination of birch and poplar and held it together with 3 inch cabinet screws. For the port and starboard walls, 5 8 marine plywood was kerf cut and then attached with number 10 stainless screws two inches long and 5200 marine adhesive. The front of the house and the top was attached using the same process. After covering the countersunk screw heads with a low density filler and a light sanding, I then laid two layers of 10 ounce fiberglass cloth in opposite directions. Using the same fairing technique, that I had perfected working on the rest of the boat, I finished off the house with two coats of epoxy primer and two coats of enamel. The decks began to leak. The previous owners put longer and longer screws in until eventually they popped out inside the boat and that let water in the forward cabin, the aft cabin, and of course on top of the fuel tanks. You can see the damage here on the top of one of the tanks around the fuel fill. To remove the tanks, I took a Makita resip saw and a metal blade and cut them out. There's really nothing quite so exciting as being in the engine room of your boat, cutting your fuel tanks, watching smoke wisp away from the blade. Once the tanks were out, I cleaned the area. Dishwasher detergent works great here and installed four plastic tanks with a custom fuel manifold and a return valve so that I could polish the fuel as well as transfer it from tank to tank. In the aft cabin, those same extra long screws rotted out the stringers that hold up the deck and additionally got to the balsa that keeps the floor level, which created a horrible smell of rotted wood. I sistered the stringers on either wall and rebuilt the floors of both cabins on either side with three quarter inch marine plywood. 
On the port side, I built an air conditioner container that I coated with epoxy so the water runover from the air conditioner wouldn't rot the wood. The professional repair that had been done to the aft deck caused a lot of water to run through the lazarette hatch down underneath the floor of the aft stateroom on its way to the bilge. Eventually, that water got underneath the thin layer of chop gun glass that covered the concrete ballast, and so every time it rained, the aft cabin smelled like wet concrete. I tore out the floor, dug out all the concrete, and mixed 150 pounds of concrete and put it back in again, covering it with kills to make it watertight, and then rebuilt the aft cabin floor. The holding tank leaked. I cut open the forward bulkhead to expose the back of the tank, thought it was empty, pulled on it, it wouldn't move. So I went up to the forward cabin and cut holes in the floor to release the tabbing that connected the tank to the stringers. It still wouldn't move. Well, as it turned out, the dip tube had broken off about 20 years ago, and you guessed it, it was full of poop. Laying on my stomach in the engine room, Using a styrofoam cup to dig out other people's poop was definitely the low point in the restoration process of the boat. Eventually, I got the tank out, cleaned the space, painted it with four coats of bilge coat, and no more poop smell. When I first got the boat, someone had bolted two blue Naugahyde seats that looked like they came out of a 70s Ford Econoline van to the cabin top. The cabin top was also coated with a very bizarre coating that looked like playground sand mixed with mud, so I knew I had problems. Taking off the top, which was insanely thick, probably 12 layers of fiberglass, I discovered that it was made up of the same blocked Luon panels that go into the deck. You can see significant areas of rot that had already started from stanchions that had not been rebedded. The brow that goes around the flybridge is actually not structural. It's a block of balsa, and the balsa wood had literally turned to mush. After removing the Luon plywood, the stick frame that was used to build the house is clearly visible. I filled the air gap with fiberglass foam insulation, did some restoration repair work at the aft end to ensure I had a proper support, and then laid two sheets of three-quarter inch marine plywood cut to fit. Here's Yorksie staying cool and supervising the construction process. On the aft end of the cabin top, I rebuilt the brow wood out of radiata pine and then covered the entire top of the flybridge with two layers of 10-ounce fiberglass cloth. Finally, I used the same leveling technique that I had perfected working on other parts of the boat. The result is a cabin top that should outlast the boat. Before putting the boat back in the water, I stripped all the teak down to bare wood and applied two coats of West System Clear Epoxy, wet sanding between each coat. On top of that, I added four layers of Z-Spar 1015 Captain's Varnish. I left the rub rail and the cap rail to be just plain varnish, as the sun would have cracked the West System epoxy fairly quickly. A very common problem with these boats is that the shaft coupling leaks. And when this happens, the water gets into the ballast inside the keel and wicks its way up underneath the engine. To fix this problem, you have to cut two holes forward of the shaft coupling to get to the bolts that hold it in place. Pull the shaft coupling off and then pull out the shaft tube itself and the shaft. Once you've done that, you need to fare the mounting plate on the back to make it flat again, and then reassemble the system, giving care to proper shaft alignment. Once that's done and sealed with 5200, it should be another 20 years 
unless someone fails to maintain the motor mounts or poorly aligns the system. I hope you've enjoyed this video documenting the restoration process and that it hasn't deterred you from acquiring and owning a Taiwanese trawler. In episode 4, I'll give a tour of the boat as it currently stands and you can take a look at all of the improvements that I made once I'd completed the restoration. One final note, they will never be able to build boats like this again because of the shortage of teak. If you own one of these boats, don't be tempted to fix it part way. You're a steward of the vessel and it needs to be preserved for future generations to enjoy. Take good care of it and it will take good care of you. In the next video, we'll bring you up to date on preparations for the great adventure and introduce you to the crew. If you like what you see, please subscribe. It really helps us out and it doesn't cost anything. We really appreciate your attention and subscription. So Darina, how can people find out more about us online? You can find us on our website page here, on our Instagram page here, and also on our Facebook page here. Once again, thank you so much for watching. And if you want to be reminded of new episodes when they come out, don't forget to ring that bell. Thank you so much.